Okay, welcome to chapter three. All right, um, I kind of expect you to already understand significant figures before you start this chapter. If you've taken this, um, if you've taken a class with me, I should say, before you already know that I love my sig figs. And the reason I love my sig figs is because I was trying to prepare you for this class. I knew you would be in it. I'm psychic like that. Um, a sig figs are a simple way of, a simply way, simple way of uh, keeping track of uncertainty in a particular measurement. Um, an operative word being measurement. So notice that sig figs only apply when we're measuring things. I expect you to have an idea of these four concepts. If you don't, that's okay. I will post them in the supplemental info. And I shouldn't even say that I expect you to have an idea. I expect you to know these and understand them. That's always really, some people know how to do it, but they don't understand why they're doing it. So the videos that I will post have not only what to do, but why you're doing it. And I expect you to know all of these bullet points. You probably also have an idea already about precision versus accuracy. Nevertheless, I'm going to go over it. Um, my son keeps having these really cool dreams. He's five years old. He has these dreams about robot zombies. And he's super gory, you guys. It's actually, maybe, maybe it's a little disturbing. Don't judge me. He doesn't watch violent movies or anything. He's just got a really great imagination. Um, the other day, he dreamt that his half of his head fell off. It was <laughs> and it stuck with him all day. He kept checking his head, the poor baby, to ensure that it didn't fall off. Um, so let's say we've got a robot zombie, and we want to take these robot zombies down. Um, let's say in order to take this robot zombie down, we need to hit it right here. And I know robot zombies are usually hit in the head, but that seems a little bit, uh, I don't know, too gory for me. So let's say there's this bullet... And we're going right for his heart right there, and actually probably should have been close to the center, but you get the gist. Okay, so if we go and we shoot that robot zombie directly in the center, that's accurate, right? Accuracy is how close a value or measurement is to the actual value. Now, one thing you might not have considered before um, is that this is also not just a value or measurement. This could also be or an average of. And I'll give you an example of that here in a little bit. So how close a value or measurement or how close an average of values or measurements are to the actual value. Uh, however, precision, if you shoot, let's say, or you, you punch them here and here, and maybe here, you're not really hitting close to your target, right? That, but, but you're hitting relatively close to each other. And this would be precision, how, how close measurements are to each other. And precision, how close measurements are to each other. Okay, so... All that's dandy, um, but understanding these two actually ends up being pretty important in analytical chemistry. Uh, the reason being is you can change your entire experiment based on how accurate or precise something comes out to be, and you use that information to figure out, uh, or rather deduce, um, what initial causes of error were because something is all precise or all accurate, etc. So let me, let me give you another example. In fact, let's, let's kind of zoom in here. So let's say your target is here. And let's say you shoot or punch here, here, and here. All really close to the target. You're really close to here in the target. This would be accurate. And those are close to each other. It would also be precise. Let's move down the line. Okay, let's shoot, say you shoot um, or punch here, here, and here. These are not close to the center. They are not accurate, but they are still precise. 
Now you can have something like this. Let's say you shoot punch there, there, and there. Those are not precise. Obviously, they're very far away from each other, but you know what? If you took an average of this, this, and this, so an average between this and this would be here, an average between this and this is there, an average between this and this is there, an average between those things would be right in the center. This is actually accurate, even though it is not precise. Finally, we have something like this, and let's say you punch here, way over here, and way down here. The average of these three is not, <clears throat> not in the center, it is not accurate. Neither is it precise, they're not close to each other. So you can have a range of these um, different situations, and based on where your measurements are coming out, you can actually uh, use those measurements to help you figure out what error might be happening and whether or not you can fix that error. All right, let's talk about the two types of error. The first is determinate error, meaning it can be determined. So going back to our zombie here, when you were hitting over here on the left-hand side, was there something you could do to adjust it to get closer to the, the uh, accurate value? The answer is yeah, you could have moved over to the right, right? If you moved all these over to the right, you'd be a whole lot more accurate. In fact, the average of those would be accurate. And so in moving them over to the right, you can adjust them. You determined the source of error. It's that it was too far, or maybe not the source, but you determined that there was an error, and that is that it is too far to the left. So this kind of error is usually caused when there's some kind of experimental flaw. but it's a consistent experimental flaw. So an example of a consistent experimental flaw might be a miscalibration. For example, if you've ever looked at those old Rolly scales, they have a little dial on them like this, and then down here they have a little knob and you can adjust where zero is you could adjust that knob down so it's starting at negative five. And if you stood on the scale, and let's say you ended up being 150 pounds, the truth of the matter is you're actually 155, but it was reducing five. And so this is a miscalibration. It started at negative five, and you can fix that. It's an experimental flaw. You can fix it by simply adding five. But if you stood on that scale, if you're 150 pounds, if you're 180 pounds, if you're 300 pounds, it doesn't matter. The air is reproducible. It will always be off by that five pounds. And because of that, um, because we, we can figure out what it's from, it's reproducible so we can make it happen all the time, we can fix it. It can be accounted for. Fixed or eventually eliminated. So if you have to have error in an, exp an experiment, um, determinant error is really nice because you can determine what's happening and figure out exactly how to fix it. Indeterminate error, eh, it's kind of a whole different ballgame. That's more like what happened right here. There's no one way that we can adjust all these values and get, the, get back to the center point. It's usually caused by completely um, uncontrollable variables. You cannot reproduce it, so this error is not reproducible. And I should probably go back here and give you an example um, like I did with the other one. So an example of an uncontrolled variable might be, let's say you've got a, a balance and there's a certain air current in the room that's causing the, the, the mass to fluctuate up and down. And if you remember last week, we talked about closing um, the sides of the balance. You wanna make sure that there's no air going in and out. 
But if you didn't do that, what would happen is at some point, if you took a measurement, it might be too low. At another point, it might be too high. And it's just as likely to be equally low as it is equally high. And you just never know what you're going to get. What makes this error kind of annoying is that you can't eliminate it. So this error can be minimized but not be eliminated. You can be really careful with, for example, massing something. But no matter what, you're always going to have a little bit of random error. Um, and so to get an idea of exactly where a measurement actually should be, what you want to do is take multiple measurements or multiple samples. Uh, what that does is it gives you more and more data points. So let's say you just, who knows what this graph is. So let's say you took one measurement, it was up here, measurement two was down here, and you're like, oh, I have no idea what this is. But as you kept going, you realize that all your measurements are kind of along the same line right here. And even though you might have had a high one and a low one at the beginning, as you take more and more, you get a better idea of what exactly the measurement is. And so in a determinate error, you want to take lots, lots and lots of measurements. And that's what in analytical chemistry, why you do take lots and lots of measurements. All right. Okay, so this paper probably looks a little bit different than, than what you just saw about, I don't know, three seconds ago. But uh, the reason being, I, I changed my approach to teaching this subject and... Um, Anyways, I just printed some new stuff, and, and hopefully this is going to help uh, make things a little more clear than my initial lecture that you won't even see. Ha <laughs> ha! Okay, so we're going to talk about um, uncertainty. So there's a few different ways to express uncertainty. Uh, in fact, we're going to talk about three of them. Absolute uncertainty probably makes the most sense. It's the most intuitive sense and, and it gives you an, an, a really good idea of what's going on. So for example, let's say you have a calibrated 50 milliliter barrette and it has an absolute uncertainty of 0.05 milliliters. Wh the way you would write that would actually be 50.00, we'll talk about why here in a second, plus or minus 0.05 milliliters. The reason that I wrote it this way is with your absolute uncertainty, you want to ensure that these have the same number of uh, or same amount of precision, or in, if there's a decimal point, in other words, the same number of decimal points. So see how this had two decimal places? You would also want this measurement to go to two decimal places because that gives you a very quick visualization to say, hey, if I took away 0.05 from this, I'd have 49.95, and if I added it, I'd have 50.05 milliliters. Okay, so how do you know if something's an absolute uncertainty? You know something's an absolute uncertainty when the units, and I don't think your book really says this, but this is an important distinction to really understand what's going on. The units of your uncertainty are the same as your measurement. So the units of your uncertainty are the same as your measurement. So we had an uncertainty of plus or minus 0.05 milliliters. We also had a burette that was 50.00 milliliters. Okay, so that's absolute uncertainty. A couple other examples maybe I can give you is, um, let's say you take the mass of something and you find it's 21.5 grams plus or minus 0 0.1 gram. That'd actually be a really crappy balance, but um, I guess it depends on the situation because you can really quickly look and say, hey, these both have the same units. They both have the same precision. And I can take one, 0.1 and add it, and I can subtract 0.1. In other words, a real quick visualization says that this is actually equal to 21.4 to 21.6 grams. Okay, so this would be the absolute uncertainty here. And this would be the absolute uncertainty here and have a good idea of what absolute uncertainty is. Okay, a slightly less intuitive one would be relative uncertainty. And this is more of an uh, intermediate step.
This is a decimal percent. And try to think about how many times you actually use a decimal percent. Usually you only use a decimal percent when you're trying to figure out the percent of something or kind of going the opposite uh, direction, which we'll talk about as well. So you're not usually going to see things reported with a uh, relative uncertainty. But let's talk about what it would be. So let's say you use that burette, which remember had 0 0.05 plus or minus 0 0.05 um, uncertainty. So if you measure in that burette and you find the volume to be 26.17, and let's give it an absolute uncertainty of 0 0.05 milliliters, the absolute uncertainty would be this. It's this number plus or minus 0 0.05 milliliters. So we'll put it absolute there. But its relative uncertainty would be the decimal percent. In other words, what is this 0 0.05 relative to the 26.17? And so we say 0 0.05 milliliters divided by 26.17 milliliters. You get a unit list, the milliliters of cancer. You get a unit list um, answer, which would be 0 0.00. 19. Um, and we'll put this down here. I'll explain why here in a second. One, nine. And this would be your relative uncertainty. Again, it's an intermediate step. And here you want to actually use sig figs. So this 0.05 only had one sig fig. You would also want this one to have one sig fig. The reason I carried that nine is because you don't want to underestimate it or overestimate it if you're going to use it in an additional calculation. And we're going to do that here in the next one. And so because of that, I, I keep it as the, this. If this were our final answer, if you're done with all calculations, and for some reason somebody's like, hey, what's the relative uncertainty? You would say it's 26.17. plus or minus 0 0.002. And oftentimes you'd wanna put this in uh, parentheses, but this is very rare that you would actually do this because as you can see, this would probably get, or this is milliliters, not grams, excuse me. This would probably get very confusing um, because it's so much like absolute uncertainty. So you're rarely actually going to present relative uncertainty. All right, now let's go to the next step, percent relative uncertainty. This is where it's going to be a little easier to present this information. So, for example, um, use the same information, and now we're going to find the percent relative uncertainty of something that has a reading that's 26.17 milliliters, but an absolute uncertainty of 0.05 milliliters. We do the same thing. We say, okay, well, what's the decimal percent? But how do you turn decimal percent into actual percent? Well, you multiply it by 100 with the units of percent. And if you do this, you gain an answer of 0 0.19. And if you're going to, uh, and that would be percent, and if you're going to present this whole thing as your final answer, you would present it as follows. 26.17 milliliters plus or minus 0.2. Percent. And oftentimes you'll even see that in parentheses as well. Depends on the publisher and the, the format that they use. So um, this is kind of an intermediate step to get to this final value. And so the two ways that you'll usually see it is represented like this, where you have a percent sign, or that 26.17. And sometimes they won't put the milliliters there, they'll put it afterwards. So this again is percent relative uncertainty, and this is absolute uncertainty. So know the difference between those two, and know the intermediate step is a decimal percent. All right. Um, note, in case this didn't come through very clearly, before I kind of move on, note that here we use sig figs, But here, when you got a unit, you want to make sure you're matching the precision. Even though it's one sig fig, you're actually just matching the precision there. All right. Air propagation. 
It's one of my faves. Okay, so if you have a lot of measurements and they all have a certain amount of, for example, absolute uncertainty, which is this example that I give here, um, you're going to want to keep track of that uncertainty throughout the measurement. And to do that, you're going to propagate it through. You're gonna move it all the way through, just like you would propagate um, a graph, et cetera. You, you wanna make sure that you have an idea of where it's going and where all your air is. So there's two main ways that we're gonna talk about. Um, and that's for calculations involving adding and subtracting and calculations involving multiplication and division. Now, there are plenty of different other math operations out there. I think you probably know that. Um, if you're looking at exponents or logs, etc., you're going to want to look up the specific error propagation for those things. The reason I don't talk about them is A, you rarely use them, and B, if I did talk about them, you'd forget about them anyways. Let's throw a C in there. You can always look it up when you need it. So, um, so I won't be testing you on that kind of stuff. This, however, this is my jam, y'all. I would totally be testing you on this because it's really important that we understand um, how to keep track of air. You don't want to just do um, a whole bunch of measurements or, or do a whole bunch of calculations and be like, it was perfect because that's not the case. Okay, so let's say you go and you measure a mouse and we already know that a mouse is about 100 grams and the mouse, um, but you have three different balances, one, two, and three. Let's say you want to, for example, maybe take an average of these three. In order to do that, you must first add them up, right? So I ask you to add them. So if you take 101.34 plus 98.71 plus 103.87, you get 303. 0.92 grams. And these errors don't just go away. You also can't just add them up because sometimes what if you have like a positive here and this one happens to be a negative error, um, which, which is possible, you'll end up getting, um, they'll end up negating themselves and you don't want to do that. So in order to um, resolve that issue, what you do, so this would be 303.92 plus or minus some kind of error. What you do is take the square root of each of them squared. So error one squared plus error two squared. I'll, I'll write it out. Error one squared plus error two squared plus error three squared. And that equals the overall error. Um, plus dot, dot, dot. So if you have more and more measurements, you continue to do it with all of them. This is where actually a cell comes in so handy because you can just plug these numbers in and drag the little slider down and it'll calculate it for you. All right, so let's go ahead and do this. Our initial error for the first one is 0.05 plus 0.08 squared plus 0.05 squared. So we have 0.05 squared plus 0.08 squared plus 0.05 squared. Gives me a square root of 0.0025 plus 0.0064 plus 0.0025. I'm just going to do it step by step so there's no confusion. And now we'll be looking at the square root of 0 0.1, or excuse me, 0 0.0114, which happens to be 0 0.107. Now let me ask you this. What kind of um, uncertainty are we presenting here? Is this an absolute? Is it a decimal percent? Is it relative uncertainty? Or is it percent uncertainty? Well, if you go back here, our original units were grams, right? So these were all grams. We squared them, then we took the square root, and we end up with grams. So this is an absolute uncertainty. And as an absolute uncertainty, you want to present with the same number of decimal places as your initial answer. So our average was 303.92 plus or minus 0. Point, and I'm going to round this one up because this is 07, 0. 0.11 um, grams. And this would be my final answer. Now I could re uh, report this as a percent uncertainty. I could take 0. 0.11 divided by 303.92 times 100%, and that would give um, me a relative percent uncertainty. Okay, so adding and subtracting, all you do is use the air. 
you square it and you take the square root. Again, all you do is you use this, you square them, you take the square root. You square them, you add them up, you take the square root. Pretty straightforward, and that's why I say keep it simple. So adding and subtracting, simple. Multiplication and division, you're going to have to do it an additional step usually. Okay, so let's say you measure the sides of a cube, a rectangular cube, and you find them to be the following. Um, and then it asks for the volume. Well, volume is length times width times height. In other words, we're going to take this times that times that. Um, first things first, don't worry about the air. Figure out the actual number because that's half the problem, right? So if we do that, we take 12.4 times 14.4 times 18.4. You get an answer of, I'll do it with you, 12.4, uh, 3,285.504. We'll go crazy with, um, with the sig figs, but an important thing to note here is that those each have three sig figs, so our final answer is gonna end up being three, two, 90. Okay, so that's cool. Let's now look at the air. Um, you can't just take each of these and square them and then take the square root. For multiplication, division, I told you you have to do that extra step. That extra step is to put these all into percent uncertainty first. Uncertainty, you can't read that anyways. That says uncertainty. I'll make it clear. There we go. Okay, so in order to do that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take 12.4. Well, just kidding. We're gonna take 0 0.02 divided by 12.4 times 100%. We'll take 0 0.02 divided by 14.4 times 100%. And we'll take 0 0.02 divided by 18.4 times 100%. Now, we're taking each of these relative amounts, dividing by here. If this error happened to be different, I would have been doing something different. The reason it's the same is because it was probably the same ruler. Um, and because I made it up, so I made it the same. Okay, so as we go through and do each of these, make sure we're keeping track of them um, really well, and keep extra sig figs, because we're going to be using them for additional measurements. So um, this ends up being 0 0.161. Um, it's okay to, to keep less, to keep three, because this one had three, and that one only had one, so three is an overestimate of sig figs. The next 1.02 divided by 14.4 times 100 would be 0 0.139. Last but not least, 0 0.02 divided by 18.4 times 100% would be 0 0.109. All right, so these would all be unitless now. Now these are all percents. So, in order to figure out the actual air, so this is 3290 um, plus or minus some air percent. We'll just go ahead and take the square root of each of these squared. So it's kind of the same process, except we had to do that one extra step. So we'll take 0 0.161 squared plus 0 0.139 squared plus 0 0.109 squared. Let's do it. 0 0.161 squared plus 0 0.139 squared plus 0 0.109 squared equals 0 0.057. Um, one, we take the square root of that, and get 0 
two, three, nine. And that would be in percent. So let me do it again real quick. Um, 0 0.161 squared. Because I didn't recognize that number. And one, two, three, nine. All right, cool. So I do get the same answer. All right, so we originally started off with just one sig fig. When you're doing percent, you look at sig figs. In other words, this would equal 3290 um, plus or minus 0 0.2 